Welcome, everyone, to the Path 11 podcast with your hosts, Mike and April. Today, we're interviewing Wendy Kennedy, who is an intuitive empath and channel. For the past 20 years, she has used her gifts and abilities to work with beings in other realms and dimensions to assist others in recognizing and releasing old patterns and helping them to live a more whole and integrative life. The clear and compassionate wisdom shared through Wendy facilitates a shift in perspective from that of separation and limitation to connection and multidimensional existence. In 1995, Wendy began channeling, working first with her own angelic guides before becoming reacquainted with the Ninth Dimensional Palladian Collective, whom she primarily channels at her public events and in private sessions. In addition to the Palladian, she works with beings from Cyrus, Lyra, and Arcturus, as well as other higher dimensional celestial beings. Wendy currently lectures and channels for clients around the world. She was one of the six channels featured in the movie and book, Tuning In, Spirit Channelers in America. Her work can also be found in the book, The Great Human Potential, Walking in One's Own Light, which is now available in six languages. So typically when we get a chance to interview our guests, we give them a call through Skype and we start our interview process. But we had something really interesting happen during this interview with Wendy. And we really want to keep our podcast as legit as possible. And we really don't want to do a whole lot of editing. But we had asked Wendy to channel during the last half hour of her interview. And so Mike's asking a bunch of questions and everything's running really smooth. And you will hear in this podcast that all of a sudden, we begin to have some technical difficulty. How would you even explain this, Mike? I don't know. I'm fairly used to Skype and the the quirks with Skype. And this is not a typical Skype bug that I've ever run across. I'm sure somebody has, but I've never heard of it. Um, So yeah, I mean, we, we, kept it in there you can still kind of hear the answer to the question and then we had a disconnect and we reconnected later and got wendy back on and uh wrapped up the interview pretty much shortly after that but yeah it was just a weird experience and then once skype acted up all the equipment kind of just reset itself which doesn't usually happen so yeah it, it was just kind of a weird thing that happened and we thought we should just explain that before we get into it and you hear the the quality of the interview just kind of go downhill you know once uh y- you'll hear it coming in and it just gets progressively worse and more echoey and reverby and uh yeah static in there is sounds weird it almost seems here we are we're talking to somebody that's channeling another dimension and the sound and quality almost sound like the entire interview completely changed there was more echoing there was almost like a reverberation of voice you could almost hear her voice and then another voice at the same time. We have no idea if this has anything to do with with channeling, but it was something kind of neat and cool that happened. And Mike and I have had some weird experiences when we were interviewing some of our experts for our documentaries where some of our lighting would blow all of a sudden. We blew fuses in, in certain interview rooms when our experts were starting to talk about some pretty in-depth stuff with energy and metaphysical stuff. So we thought it was cool to keep it in here. We hope you enjoy the show. Uh, Wendy was really great to talk to, and here's her interview. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Hi. Hi, Mike. Hi, April. Thank you so much for having me. I'm well. Yes, we, we've been interested in channeling for the last few years now, and we want to know, basically, how did you get started with channeling? Well, I started having visions, and I didn't really know what they were, and this was in the mid-90s. And so I started doing some research on the building that I was living in because I thought maybe it had something to do with the building. And as I found out later, it had to do with a past life that was being activated, that I was seeing this past life. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. And in my research, I came across channeling. And I didn't know anybody who channeled. I didn't really even know what it was but I knew it was something that I was supposed to be doing. And I can remember saying to people that I knew close friends, I said, this sounds crazy. I know I'm supposed to be doing this thing. I don't have a clue how I'm supposed to be doing it. And they were very supportive. They thought it was very interesting and cool. And they said, well, if, you, if you're able to do it, let me know, because I'd love to, to ask some questions. And so I found a couple of books on the subject and I started reading and trying to do exercises. And at the time, I was doing a lot of 
work on myself. I was studying meditation and I could feel things in my body, but I couldn't get the words out when I tried to channel. I had a very visceral response. My, uh, my limbs would tingle and my eyes would flutter in water, uh, but the words just weren't coming. And so I practiced for off and on for about a year, maybe not quite that long. And then one day I knew I was supposed to sit down with a pen and paper and I started doing automatic writing. It just started coming out. And I did that for about nine months until it was becoming quite cumbersome for me. I was already hearing the words well in advance of the writing and I put the pen down and I started doing direct channeling, which is what I do today. And can you describe for those who have no idea what channeling means, uh, the definition of it or uh, a good explanation for somebody who is just tuning in and this is the first time that they've ever heard of the concept of channeling. Well, I describe channeling as bringing in energy and putting it into a recognizable form. So absolutely everything is made up of energy. It vibrates. It has a very specific frequency. And it's just like working with a radio where you find the station that you want. You tune into that frequency and then you just have to turn the volume up to hear it. So that's in essence what we're doing. We're finding a particular frequency. So someone who works with people who passed away, that's a particular frequency. If you are working with angels, that's another frequency. ETs, um, celestial beings, those all have unique frequencies about them. And the same thing with the Akashic Records, looking at um, the records of all that ever was and ever will be. Going in and reading those energetic frequencies. And then we can interpret that energy in just about any creative fashion. So to me, painting, drawing, dancing, those can all be forms of channeling as we allow that energy just to flow through us. For me, I do it through writing and I also do it through speaking. So all of us have this ability. It's not just that a few have it. Absolutely everybody has the ability and we do it every day. We just don't recognize that that's what we're doing because we're working with subtle energy. It isn't always really, really obvious. And it's amazing to me that, you know, I'll be having a conversation with someone and all of a sudden the frequency will change. And because I've been doing this for 20 years, I recognize the frequencies and they'll start channeling, but they won't have any idea that that's what they're doing. But, you know, I think we've all done it in some sense that we have the recognition that we gave usually really sound advice to someone. We thought, wow, that was really profound. Where did that come from? So um, we all have the ability and it's not limited just to a special few, but some of us, it's a little easier for us to open up to. Can you give an example exactly what you meant, you just meant by the, everybody kind of does it every day? Um, Mm -hmm. Is it... Because I know like when you watch TV for a while, and this is like hypnosis. Um, everybody does goes into hypnosis without knowing it. Is that kind of the same thing when you're talking with somebody and all of a sudden you have like a constant stream of speech? Um, is that kind of what you mean? Or In some ways, there's a, there's a higher level of awareness that they access. Uh, they're not processing so much through their ego. They're not processing through their own fear programs. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that usually um, we do this when we're in service to others. So if you have someone who's coming to you with a problem, you have a tendency to put yourself back in your heart center and your heart center is where you don't have the filters of the ego. You don't have all the beliefs that I'm not good enough. I'm not deserving. I'm not lovable. My guides described as having almost two operating systems. We have the one that we perceive reality from where we experience separation and then one in which there are no filters of separation, which is our true state of being. So when we're in service to others or when we're working with others who are, who are struggling and we're operating from a state of compassion, then those filters aren't in place. So if you've got a friend who's, who's really struggling and you have a lot of compassion, you tend to speak from your heart and it's in those moments where you give that really profound advice. Um, another example is just when you, you all of a sudden have a hit of inspiration or, um, intuitively, you know, something 
those are subtle frequencies and most of us don't really acknowledge or have an awareness that that's, um, that that is often guidance that we're receiving. Okay. Now you you first started channeling the Pleiadian collective. Did I say that right? You did say it right. Um, okay. Actually, I started working with my own angelic guides. Okay. okay. And uh, the Pleiadians didn't come in until I started channeling verbally. And I actually work with uh, a number of guides before them. And the Pleiadians actually work with tone and sound. And their dialect is slightly different than mine when I channel. And it's not any one particular dialect. It's just tones and sounds that resonate with the individual that I'm channeling for or for the group that I'm channeling for. Those tones and sounds resonate at a cellular level. So they help to move energy in your in your field. And then also they work with the with the cellular structure. The other beings that I work with don't really work in the same way. They sound more like me. Um, they feel different. Uh, there's a different quality about the information and my voice, but they sound much more like myself. But yes, the, the Pleiadian Collective came in uh, probably about nine months after I started channeling, but they were waiting for me to go uh, to start channeling verbally. Okay, because I first found you through the, the uh, film Tuning In, I think that was 2008, and that's who you were channeling in the film, and I just found it very fascinating. Now, how exactly they're ninth dimensional Pleiadians? Yeah. Okay. The way that my guides describe it to me is that there are 12 dimensions in this universe. And you'll hear lots of different numbers. Um, sometimes you'll hear 144 dimensions. And I've, I've heard a lot of other numbers as well. But they say it's just in how they're, how they're measuring it. It would be like the difference of uh, meters or um, feet. But from their perspective, there are 12 dimensions. And the 12 combine to form the one, which is source level, which, which if you want to think about it, could be, the, could be seen as the 13th dimension. Okay. The third dimension is one of duality. It's one of density, and it's one of the illusion of separation so that we can experience time. Time is a construct of the dimension. And it's the only dimension in which we perceive ourselves this way. It's very unique um, because in all the other dimensional ranges, we have the ability to see things from a multidimensional perspective. We can see ourselves as being an individuated consciousness as well as part of the unified whole. Now, the, the fourth dimension is kind of a transitory dimension. The third dimension has very fixed rules to it. Uh, you've got polarity. You've got uh, the illusion of separation and the, the perception of time. The fourth dimension is a very malleable one in that you can take the rules to the 3D game and put it on top of the fourth dimension, or you can also take the, the rules of the fifth dimension and put it onto that fourth dimensional range. This was originally a game of polarity integration, so what we did is we descended down into 3D to see how far we could go with it and whether we could come back out of it up to a state of awareness that we were part of that collective whole. And so the fifth dimension has that awareness. So as we're trying to move from three to five, we can play around in the fourth dimension so that as we go through our day, we have the ability to kind of... Um, try on different rules, try on working in different ways without actually having to fully step into that fifth dimensional energy because it's so vastly different. We needed a whole dimensional range to play. So right now we're actually in the fourth dimensional range, but most of us won't perceive it as being any different because we're still applying 3D rules to the, to the game. Um, we might have moments where we easily or immediately manifest things, that's more of the fifth dimensional rules playing out. Because once you get up to the fifth dimensional level, you understand that you are a creator of your reality and things are instantly manifested because there is no time. So that's kind of a, a brief explanation. As you go up in the dimensional range, um, each of the dimensions is 
slightly different. There are different rules. It would be like playing soccer or basketball or baseball. It's it's what game do you want to play in, and you can actually move around much more freely than you can move out of 3D because 3D is so dense. It seems so real. It's very difficult to move out of the illusion of it. So the beings that I work with are ninth dimensional Pleiadians. They don't have physical form. They're beings of light. And I think a lot of people, when they hear the word Pleiadian, they th think of Billy Myers. They think of the blonde haired Nordics, the fifth yes. dimensional beings. And that's all they think about. The Pleiades is an open cluster of stars in the Taurus constellation. And my guides tell me there are actually about 750 stars that are part of the system. So it's a really big system. To say that there's only one species in one dimension there is rather limiting. Um, so I don't really work with physical fifth dimensional Pleiadians. I only work with the ninth dimensional energetic collective because I'm actually a part of the collective. There's an aspect of me that's part of the collective. And um, so it was part of my contract to work with them again and bring through some of the information that they're sharing right now. Okay. So does that help? Yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> what just the dimensional try, structure is? Yes, I, I'm still trying to absorb some of that. I, I'll give you a little bit of my background. And... Uh, I grew up in a really Catholic family, growing up very religious. And of course, there was parts of me that went, you know, I tried to branch out and learn about UFOs. And, and later, um, I had an awakening, uh, learning about the afterlife. So, there's part of me that had, you know, when I hear channeling, I kind of put on the brakes <laughs> a little bit. And I try not to. I'm trying to be very open to it. And it was um, about 2008, 2009 maybe a little earlier, my mother introduced me to the Abraham, the Abraham Hicks material. And of course, that's Esther Hicks, who's channeling the collective group of Abraham. And I was very reluctant at first. And over time, I, I listened to it. And I was always a little skeptical. I really liked the message, but I really was skeptical about, is she actually channeling some other energy source? Uh, it, I I had a hard time dealing with that because growing up, I always thought, you know, if you're receiving information from another entity that you cannot see, is that a form of possession? <laughs> and so I had a hard time with that. And I'm trying to get to my limitations of that, um, my thoughts anyway. But recently, watching the movie Tuning In and hearing from other channelers as well as yourself, uh, around the same time, I was listening to the Explorer Files, which are recordings that Robert Monroe had done um, back in the 70s to early 80s. And some of those are actually channeled uh, recordings. And we've done a lot of work with the Monroe Institute and uh, doing research for our films. I came into it with, with a lot of respect for the Institute and a lot of work that they had done. I know that they weren't trying to pull anybody's leg or just trying to sell books. So there is, I see that and I, I see a lot of legitimacy behind the uh, channeling phenomenon. And one of our uh, speakers in our films is Tom Campbell. And he can a can't actually do channeling, but he's worked with other people at the Monroe Institute through channeling. And he does say that it is legit. <laughs> experience. So I have all that, this battle of accepting it going on in my head, and I really want to accept it. And I wish, and lately um, doing research on you and watching Tuning In again, it's like I kind of want a channel now. Is there any <laughs> way, way I can get started? Or do you think, and I, one of the other things I heard too, and I'm kind of going on this long rant here, is that this was set up before you were born into this lifetime. Is that true or is this something that you can change? It, it's not set in stone that you're either a channeler or you don't. I, I mean, not, and you kind of brought something into it earlier where you said that everybody kind of subtly does it throughout the day and we don't even know it. But is this something, if I, it's something that I want to do, can I do it? Or is it something that I had to arrange ahead of time? 
Now think of it this way, you know, all of us like to sing, but are all of us going to do that for a living? Are all of us going to be at the top of the field? There are things that we all like to do, but are we the best at it? Is that our strongest and greatest gift? So I think everybody has the ability to do it. And the hardest part of channeling, well, there are two pieces actually. One is letting go of your fears because fears will keep you from accessing the higher frequencies. And the other is trusting in what you get. And that comes with practice and that comes with time. And, you know, there... There's a lot of religious programming for people about accessing higher realms. And my guides have talked extensively about some of this conditioning. And with a lot of religion, there was also a lot of control. And it was done at a time where it was to either curtail war or it was done to amass wealth. And so that programming is still in the collective psyche. Um, There's also a lot of fear of persecution because all of us have had many lifetimes of persecution. I mean, today, if you look at the planet, we persecute each other for everything, for our sexual orientation, for our religions, for our wealth or lack of wealth. Fill fill in the blank. We persecute each other for it. So... Those kinds of programs have to be released before you can really start accessing it in a very clear way. And I think it's really important to have a healthy dose of skepticism, even when you're working with interdimensional beings, because any issues that you have with humans on this planet, you will also play out interdimensionally with other beings. So if you've got control issues, you're going to find that those control issues will also play out with interdimensionals. Um, If you've got issues of abandonment, that will also show up. So absolutely everything will be reflected to you. And you have to take the bits and pieces that resonate with you in the moment. To be honest, does it really matter what the source is if it's resonating with you? Whether somebody's making something up or not, if it resonates with you as your truth and in that moment that aligns with you, um, I think that's the piece to take away. And... There are plenty of channels out there that the information is not so great. It doesn't resonate as my truth, but it may resonate as someone else's. It may be exactly what they needed to hear in the moment to get them where they needed to go. So um, I want to come back around to your question about channeling. So all of us have the ability and we're hardwired one of three ways to interpret the frequencies through our senses. And okay. feel free to stop me at any time <laughs> if you if you want to want me to go into more detail or any of this or no I'm just I'm just kind of sitting over here laughing at, laughing at Mike because I, what he doesn't realize is that he already is a channeler with some of the the film work that we're doing (laughs) you know when we even sat in the editing room I remember when we did our first screening of our first film the path afterlife we both kind of walked away from it like I don't remember editing that do you and I said no I don't remember I don't remember that part either (laughs) so here he is saying I want to maybe try to channel and I'm thinking well you've already channeled two films for for spirit or whoever is kind of you know come in to bring our films into existence I know we have both removed our ego from the process of that and we know that there's a lot of stuff that happens with the films that has nothing to do with either Mike or myself so I just kind of got a kick of uh, kick out of him saying I, I'd kind of like to channel I'm thinking well you already have <laughs> well, that's exactly it. you know we do it every day it's just so subtle we don't always notice it like I said we expect this big aha moment where the skies open and there's this big loud booming voice that speaks to us and it, it's just not that way it's very subtle. And I think people get really frustrated when they first start channeling because they're expecting something like that. And I, even in my own life, I've had maybe two or three experiences that were so strong that I knew without a doubt that it was beyond me. Even now, I can feel in the moment that something is really clear. And especially if I'm, in, if I'm invested in the answer at the ego level, if I'm attached to an outcome, you know, I'll go back, I'll get the information, it's really clear in the moment, and then I'll go back and pull it apart in the ego, or with the mind. And at that point, it just doesn't work. I'll go back into doubt and say, was that that really what I 
you know, was that really accurate or is that just what I wanted to hear? Or, you know, we, we all do this. And as I was saying, that's the hardest part of channeling is trusting. You got to right. trust what you get in that moment. If it's clear to you, take it as being valid because the second you go back to your ego, you're going to pull it apart. Uh, and, and it is when we're in that heart centered space, it really resonates as true. Uh, you can feel it in every fiber of your being. Now, with the senses, as I was talking about, um, the frequency, we interpret it through one of the five, phys- well, three of the physical senses. Um, you're either going to hear it, you're going to see it, or you're going to feel it. You're going to be clairaudient, clairsentient, or clairvoyant. And it's just one is, is stronger than the other. You have a genetic propensity for it. Um, it's like being right or left-handed. It's just easier to be one or the other. You can actually be ambidextrous. You can actually work with interpreting frequencies through all the senses. And the more that you actually channel and the more that you do your inner work, the more you will start to receive information through all of the senses. But usually one of those is dominant. Okay. All right. And do you hear, are you clairsentient, clairaudient? What's the word? Clear audience? Clear audience? Yes. Yeah. So I actually am a clear sentient. I feel everything in my body and I'm actually highly empathic. So I feel everything that's going on with everybody else. And I think in some ways being clear sentient is the most challenging of all of the ways to interpret frequency because we're simply not used to interpreting the signals that our body gives us. We're used to hearing and seeing and that's, that's how we receive the majority of the information consciously. Uh, as we move throughout our day, but being a clairsentient, um, I, I feel things in my body. I'm, I'm hypersensitive. Um, so, you know, working with, um, working with any sort of energy healing or even in allopathic medicine, my body reacts very quickly. Um, and things are very strong in my body. Uh, so I have to, I have to be aware of that. When I, when I do work with any sort of medicine or herbs, but I think for you, if you know, you, you can check in for yourself, just to ask yourself intuitively, which do you think you use? Do you get more information through your vision? Do you get more through your hearing? So, or through the body. Now the vision, it can be what you literally see with your eyes. You might see auric fields, you might see energy, or you might have daydreams or night dreams where information comes to you. You might have images that just kind of flash through your mind. Uh, It might be like a film strip. And then with Claire uh, audience, you may hear things literally as you're hearing my voice, or you might hear the voice in your head, just like you're reading a book, but it might have a different quality about it. And then as a Claire sentient, you might also... Uh, in addition to what I was describing, you might also feel what someone else is feeling. So if somebody comes in with an upset stomach, you might all of a sudden feel that in your own body. You might feel where they have an ache, a pain, or a block. Now, I noticed in the in the film Tuning In, the, the, the other channelers in the film, are everybody seemed to have a similar but very different style, if that makes sense. Uh, the one that stands out in my head was the... Uh, the gentleman uh, who was channeling the uh, the Indian chief. Now, it seemed to be, I don't know if you want to talk about him at all, but that he was hearing somebody talk to him and then just relaying it to the person, the reporter of the film. Is, is that what was going on? Or is it more he's trying to process a block of information or trying to relay a, a feeling that he had? You know, I can't remember exactly what the clips were. Um, there, there are a couple of things I'd say about that. One, the energy is different with each guide. And I know with, with John Kelly, who channels Chief Joseph, yes, very yes. lovely heart-centered energy. And the vibration of Chief Joseph is not as different from our frequency as say the Pleiadian Collective or um, uh, being in a higher dimensional realm because the, the life experience is, is more relatable. The frequency that's being transmitted is slightly different. And so it doesn't feel as different 
as say um, John's frequency. It it there's a subtle difference between it. Uh, this is my personal experience of it. So uh, there were times where I believe he was actually channeling, but it it seems more like just a simply heart centered person. Um, and I, I would say that's probably my guess of what was going on. There is also there are also different kinds of channeling. So there's what I call direct channeling, which is I think what you see primarily in that film. And then there's also what I call translation. So I will hear the guides and then I'll just repeat what they have to say. Um, I'll kind of summarize it and then repeat it back. When I direct channel, I don't know exactly what's coming out of my mouth the moment that it's coming out. It's it's like a split second before. Okay. And um, it's almost like what I get energetically is so much more than the words that come out. The words that come out might be it's a nice day, but the information that I receive in that moment is that at 75 degrees, there's a light breeze, the birds are chirping, um, you know, there are children playing down on the corner. So there's a lot more that gets contained in the energy transmission than just w the words that are coming out. Um, okay. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, pretty much. Because I, I was just going to say that with uh, Chief Joseph, it was kind of like, it was more like himself where he was just kind of sitting there talking like a regular, you know, Yeah, I person. think that's because the frequency is, isn't is quite as different as, say, an ethereal being. Right. And I noticed, yeah, with everybody else, they were kind of, and yourself included, you're kind of like in a, with your eyes closed and you're just on a flow, you know, you just had it. Um, and I, I'm sure the editors of the film were probably <laughs> getting upset because of the, a lot of times it is an intuitive and a feeling and you do work. There is a flow with the editing um, and a lot of it is sound and pacing. And I'm sure that they were probably getting upset every time they had to go to Chief Joseph where the flow would just change dramatically. And as a viewer, I picked up on it, but um, I just wanted to know the difference with what he was doing than compared to what you were doing and some of the others. And uh, Yeah, open eyes, closed eyes, you know, that also, I think most of us have the ability to do it with our eyes open. It's just, it's just a distraction as well. Okay. There are too many things to distract me that pull me out. If I'm, if I'm in my home and I'm doing a private session, then yes, I can. Cause I'm, it, there aren't as many things to distract me as opposed to working with a group. Um, so for me, it's a point of distraction. Okay. And the other question I had was you're getting information from a higher realm. What if somebody came up to you and started speaking, asked you a question in Spanish how would that translate to them and how could they talk back through you if you don't know Spanish? Um, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really. And here's why, because my ego gets too involved because, okay. um, I think we all do it energetically. We read, we, we read energy, we read body language, we read all of that. Um, you know, we walk in a room, we know if people have been having an argument, you can feel it. And in some ways, it's the same thing. But when it comes to, um, I mean, I can I can go in and I can ask, but there is a part of me that has so much doubt about that um, sometimes, you know, because it's, um, yeah, the ego just gets involved. And when the ego gets involved, you can't channel. You have to be in the operating system of the heart. And if you're in your head, it doesn't work. And a situation like that is probably going to create too many questions of my own. It's very difficult to get out of my, out of my head. Now I'm actually probably newer to channeling and a little familiar about in the past two years, but I've never heard of the uh, Palladians before. So I'm curious to know, cause I know we might get a chance to actually have you channel for us on our podcast here, but what is their message? What, what are they trying to bring forth through you and what type of message are they trying to spread to the masses to affect our consciousness here? I think it's really about empowering us to take responsibility in our creation of reality and processing through our fears. 
they do share a fair amount of information on galactic history and the game that we're playing in. So we have some sort of framework for for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but that's really their their big concern. It's not that they want you to be dependent on the information that they are providing. They want you to learn how to use your own discernment and to start uh, accessing information within yourself. Now, I'm not sure if I heard you right in the beginning, um, just a while back in our interview, but are you feeling or sensing that you are a part of this dimension, but you were kind of brought here and that's why maybe you were kind of chosen to use them as a channel here in the physical realm? So I'm actually part of that collective. There's another aspect of myself. So if you want to think of it as another lifetime, okay. it is a part of that group because time doesn't really exist. The past, present and future are all going on concurrently. What, what, we might consider to be a past life is actually happening right now uh, and another expression of, of the now moment. And there is a part of me, an aspect of me, that is part of the, that collective, part of that group of 2,500 beings that, that make up the collective. And so that's why they, they're able to work with me. The, the Earth is is a grand experiment. And what we're doing is playing out galactic issues on a small scale here on the planet. And so there were a lot of beings who were interested in what was going on. And so in order to, to participate, you either had to have an aspect of yourself on the planet, or you had to have a contract with one of the beings on the planet. So, I had both with this particular collective and they, I think have always been with me. And, um, it's funny, I was just channeling, uh, about an hour before we started and they were telling me that I'm, I'm going through my own shift in work and in my own frequency. And I don't feel them at the moment in the same way as I have in the past. And they told me that they have been with me always, and they will always be with me, uh, throughout my entire life, even though it feels a little different right now. And um, I guess the other question that comes to mind as I hear you explaining it that way, if when you say that it's this group of consciousness is 2,500 beings, I think of it as a soul group. I've heard of con the concept of a soul group before. So would that be uh, right to say that this is a soul group that you're a part of? In some ways you could say that. Um, the soul group is much larger than this small collective. But yes, it is part of my soul group. And then my other thought is, if you, if there's this aspect of you that is a part of that collective and is also here, then I, my first thought was, well, then are there more of you? <laughs> like, are there more people of this Palladian collective that have that contract also here on Earth? And if so, have you connected with um, other humans that are using this type of channeling through the ninth dimension? Um, and, you know, it's almost like, I guess, certain mediums, if they are channeling people who have passed, that they might, you know, want to all sit around and just kind of discuss the work that they're doing because they can relate to that. Do you have any experience meeting other people that are also channeling this ninth dimension? Well, when I first started channeling about a, about, um, a year and a half after I actually started the automatic writing, I met... Um, a woman through work at the time and felt very, she felt very familiar to me and we became fast friends and she said, you've got to meet my other friend. And so I did. And at the time, um, they both read tarot and they were both, um, opening up and starting to channel on their own. They just didn't really realize that that's what they were doing. And so the three of us would get together. One of these uh, lovely ladies is Nora Harold, who actually channels the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective as well, because um, when we first started, they had already come to me. And so when we would practice, they would also come through her and work with her as well. So she still works with them. And we have done events together uh, and separately. She channels a number of other beings, and I actually channel quite a few beings, but the Pleiadian Collective comes through first and foremost whenever I work with the public. 
Okay, great. So Thank you. Beyond Nora, um, I'm not really sure. Um, I, to my knowledge, um, they will work with anyone who wants to connect with them. It's not that it's an exclusive contract. And I've heard, like, listening to especially Abraham, um, for example, and some of the other channelers within the film tuning in, a lot of the message is about law of attraction. And I don't know, I, maybe I haven't, and you, you've kind of talked about that in tuning in, um, where it's, and you said it before, it's totally about empowering yourself, you know, working with your passion to kind of achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Is it, Do they talk about a lot of other things or is law of attraction the big message that they're trying to get across to this planet? It's one of it's one of the basic tenets of this dimensional construct. So we operate under attraction and reflection. That's the piece that the P's also focus on. I, I the P's. Um, so the ninth dimensional Pleiadian collective I also refer to as the P's. Okay, and yeah. um, they um, they talk a lot about this because this is how we go through the process of integration. For them, the main focus of the work is all about integration, which is releasing judgment. It's releasing your attachment to a polarity, that this is right, that this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. Those are both uh, two sides of the same coin. So it's instead of seeing it as being a side of the coin, it's seeing that you're actually working with a coin. You can't have one without the other. And to make one wrong is to create the illusion of separation. It's to make it distanced from you. And it's seeing that you're whole in one. And, and so they spend a lot of time talking about using attraction and reflection. So the attraction part, I think most people get. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's so amazing about Abraham Hicks is that they're very focused on uh, the, their message. It doesn't threaten anyone's religious beliefs, really. Uh, it's really just talking about working with the laws of attraction, which I think transcends just about um, any religion on the planet. And you can work through attraction, but you have to also look at reflection. Because I think what will happen is we will say, well, things aren't showing up. I'm not getting what I want, but you have to pay attention to what is showing up because the universe will show you where you're vibrating. So as you work with, uh, with frequency, what happens is you, you hold a particular resonance in your field based on your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Most of those are running at the subconscious level and they're constantly being pulsed out. And then you have conscious thoughts, which further amplify and intensify the energy as it's being sent out. The universe responds by aligning you with this, this particular frequency. Because this was such a challenging game to play in, we needed to have reflection. We needed to ha be shown what was resonating at the subconscious level. So whatever is in front of us is a vibrational match for us. So what is in front of us? If we keep creating arguments and discord, then that's telling us that there's a program running at the subconscious level that we need to address, that we need to look at. It's, it's in front of us so that we can release it, so that we can let go of our judgment, we can let go of our fears. Uh, if you think about it this way, um, it's often like we get really excited of, of creating something, and it's a very high vibration that we want to create. So it's, it's like we've elevated ourselves up to the rooftop of a building, and we, we throw that energetic boomerang out there to the universe, and the universe brings it back, and we've manifested it. What usually happens is that we get really excited about creating something. We think good thoughts and, and we align ourselves in the moment with what we want. And we throw that boomerang out there. And then we start to go into our fears. I'm not good enough. I'm not deserving. This doesn't work. And so with each of those lower thoughts, we drop out of that frequency. So now we're standing on the fifth floor. But the order we put in was at the rooftop level. So we aren't at our delivery address. It comes back there, but we think that it just hasn't shown up because we don't realize that we're not standing in the same place. We're not vibrationally in the same place. So you have to pay attention to what is being reflected back to you so that you can elevate yourself again. And the way that you elevate yourself is by letting go of your judgments. You talked about uh, the grand experiment for Earth 
do you know if there? <laughs> how will we know if the experiment is a success? Is there a, like an endpoint, or is it just like an infinite experiment? In some ways, it's it's like an infinite experiment in that every version is available. There are versions where it hasn't worked. There are versions where it's worked. We happen to be standing on. If you're having the conversation with me, you're, <laughs> you're on a version that's working because that's what's going on in mine at the moment. Uh, at that's good to know. <laughs> so, um, you know, every now moment is built upon an agreed upon set of circumstances. So you have the energy that the collective is creating. Those are the kinds of things like our past. We've had World War One. We've had World War Two. This happened on this date. That happened on that date. So there are things that we agreed on. There's our story that we tell ourselves. And then we have our personal version. And there are, there are infinite frequency expressions of this. And we move from, from now moment to now moment. We move from uh, each one of these versions. Now that the, the agreed upon set of circumstances aren't changing dramatically. And that's what gives us the illusion of linear time. It is possible to move to a version where something completely different is going on, but because it is so radically different, we're probably not going to be doing it because it's going to pull us out of the illusion of the game that we're playing in, and we want to play in the game. So we tend to make small steps, um, but from, from what I understand, there are versions where it has not gone well, and we just happen to be focusing our soul's energy into the version in which it is still the potential at least is that it succeeds. Okay. Now I only got a couple more questions for you. Um, I was thinking, um, you mentioned before that, you, you know, your ego plays a part and sometimes listening to the answers and has there been a revelation I, that, the, that they have told uh, maybe a client or to us at a seminar that the answer was so, shocking that it pulled you out or am I thinking am I on the wrong track with thinking um, I would say it's probably the other way around I would say there have been times where a client has asked a question that was a bit shocking to me and and it pulled me out because there I thought you know they're just wondering what they're going to say in response and they always remind me of that moment I don't have to answer. I just have to get out of the way and let them answer. And um, yeah, their answers never really shock me. It's probably more my clients' questions or, okay. or somebody else's earthly question. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, we've all had some crazy <laughs> experiences in this life. So some of the things we create is just amazing to me. Um, so I'd say it's probably more the questions. And, and like I said, I have to stop and recenter myself. And it's a constant process with that. I think for a lot of people, especially if they're just starting to channel, they have this idea in their head that that once you get it down, it's just easy and simple. And even for me now, after 20 years, I have to keep in recentering myself. If I get pulled out, I have to come back to center. Every channel colors the information in some way. It's impossible for me not to color the information through my experience in some way because I'm translating the frequency and that's why it's so important for me to work on myself and let go of more and more of my own illusions of separation and judgment but even when I channel there is there's a process of resetting that I have to do okay it's much much easier now <laughs> yeah <laughs> 20 years <laughs> but because really in the beginning as I as I mentioned I worked with uh Nora Harold and another friend and it was wonderful because mm, I would be able to listen while someone else asked the question and somebody else channeled the answer because I would I would hear the the answer before it was channeled so I got really fast confirmation on on the information and there were times where we would drop out of frequency and there would be lower vibrational beings who would want to connect with us and I wouldn't recognize it right away. And, you know, you mentioned possession earlier. The thing that guides tell me about possession is that it's extremely, extremely, extremely rare. And it is part of a soul contract. Um, but there are lower dimensional beings that are going to want to play with you. 
Uh, just like being here on earth, there may be people as you walk down the street that want to engage with you or want to talk to you and you may not feel the desire to connect or talk with them. They're just not a vibrational match. So you'll definitely experience that kind of thing. But you just learn to use your discernment to say, mm, this doesn't feel so good. This doesn't feel high. Um, it feels very, it, it doesn't make, make me feel good. And if you're working with any sort of higher vibrational being, they will always try to find a way to put information to you that doesn't elicit more fear because that defeats the purpose. So it's not that they're not giving you the truth. They're just trying to find a way to put it that doesn't activate all of your fear programming. So if you are working with some being that, that does make you feel that way, then you need to ask to work with someone else. Yeah. I, I was very curious about the uh, possession thing. That was actually a, uh... I was leading into a question with that. So that's a soul contract that's prearranged before coming into this world. Now I had, you know, you see Hollywood and like the, the movie, the exorcist, for example, that was all, you know, that came from a Ouija board. And, you know, I was always told, um, more recently with the, uh, working with, uh, Tom Campbell and, uh, William Buhlman, I can't remember who said it, but it's kind of like, when you use a Ouija board and you're just contacting, you know, you have no intention behind who you want to contact or a certain vibration that you're trying to reach. It's kind of like calling um, a payphone in Times Square. You don't know who's going to pick up the other side. That's and a great analogy. It's, so it's kind of like, the, uh, you know, you, you have to have that feeling ahead of time, you, you know, or that, that work you do, the preparation that you were talking about. That, that, that does make sense. Um, a lot. So I think we want to get into the channeling part now, if you're ready. I'm good. Okay. And do you know who was going to come through ahead of time or? Um, well, the Pleiadian Collective tends to always come through first and foremost for me. Um, other guides may blend their energy with the collective and it's almost like a braid of energy. Uh, one, because it's easier for me. It, if you think about it, it's, it puts me at ease. Um, it would be like going to a coffee shop and meeting a friend who is introducing you to one of their friends as opposed to just showing up and meeting their friend without them being there. Uh, it's just more, much more comfortable to have somebody um, be the intermediary there. So the Pleiadian Collective almost always comes through first and foremost. Okay. And I, yeah, they're telling me they'll be the ones to come through today. Uh, so it'll take, take me just a second here. Um, the one thing I always like to tell people, again, um, they are working with tone and sound, which is why their dialect is different than my own. It's not any one particular dialect. It's just tones and sounds that resonate with you at the cellular level. And, um, you know, it, it does change from time to time. It used to sound far more British, and then it, it went more towards an Australian slant, and then it kind of came, came back more towards the middle here. But um, it's just tones and sounds that resonate at the cellular level. Okay. All right. So we'll see where we go. Ah, oh, yes. Hello, dear. This is the Ninth Dimensional Pleiadian Collective, and it is a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to connect with you all. So uh, we're going to cover a fair amount of ground with you today. We're very excited to have the opportunity, but let's dive in and see where you would like to begin first, and, and then we'll, we'll weave in the few pieces of information that we want to cover. Well, we were just thinking exactly that. Uh, where should we start? Um, when we were talking with Wendy, we kind of brought up the Earth as being the grand experiment. How is Earth from your perspective? Uh, how is Earth doing or how does Earth exist? Yeah, well, it, uh, Wendy kind of shut down my, ans my, my answer in thinking because she had said that there's many varieties of where Earth is during the experiment. We're succeeding and there's some versions where we're failing. I was just curious <laughs> before knowing that where we are and uh, um, yeah, I don't, maybe I don't know how to phrase well, that. Let's say this, you're in a period of intensity that the next two years are going to be really challenging for you all. And the reason we say that is because you're being asked to let go of your old programs. 
uh, you're being asked to look at the places where you are carrying your, your greatest fear. For many of you, that's around persecution. Some of you, it's about control. You want to know exactly how something is going to play out before you step into it. And you get very attached to what it looks like. Control can be one of those things that's quite subtle. And you all do it. And it's one of the things that you're being asked to let go of. And that makes it feel very uncomfortable for most of you because you have the illusion that that control keeps you safe. What that control actually does is keep you small. That control keeps you separate. It keeps you in pain and discomfort. So what you're being asked to do is let go of the need to know exactly what something is going to look like. As children, you didn't really have any idea what your experiences were going to be like. You didn't know what it was going to be like to finger paint until you got in there and, and got busy with the finger paints in that particular body. You didn't know what a, a bike was going to feel like to ride. So everything was a new experience and you were brave enough to give it a go until you started uh, accepting the programs of the collective consciousness of your parents, of your family line that said, this can create pain for me. And uh, you had your own personal experiences that reinforce that. And so you quickly learned that mm, I have to be more cautious about what I step into and explore. And now as adults, most of you are not very adventuresome. You're not willing to step out of the box because you're afraid of pain. And it really limits you in so many ways. But it's reworking, recalibrating what it is you're doing, trying things on that, that aren't heavily weighted, meaning it's not that you are just going to quit your job one day and go try and do something else. That's a big leap for you. So it's trying smaller things first. And just because you've tried something when you were uh, 20 years old, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the same experience for you now at 40. Uh, or even at 30, because you're not, no longer the same vibrational being. So the next two years are going to really ask you to process things in a different way, to try different, different ways of thinking and uh, release your emotional attachments. And uh, that can show up in the disintegration or the, that's such a strong word, we're a little hesitant to even use that, in the shifting of some of your institutions, uh, the global financial system. Uh, we're not looking at a collapse, but we are looking at some shifts and that make, might make some of you a bit nervous. And so you, you want to plan, you want to control how that's going to happen and how it's going to impact you as opposed to being present in your moment and knowing that you create your reality not by what is externally pressing in upon you, but you create your reality by your vibration that you hold in the now moment. And so it's a very different way of operating. You're also activating more of the divine feminine energy, which is about the restorative energy, about being in a state of receipt of energy. And you have been so conditioned to work with the masculine energy, which is all about the doing state. It's all about the action. And you haven't acknowledged the feminine at all. And many of you are sick because of this. You haven't taken time to restore and, and nourish yourself and get quiet so that you can get internal guidance, so that you can get your hits of inspiration as to what the next step should be in your process. And once you start to do that, then you're going to find that creating becomes much easier because the process of creation involves both the divine feminine and the divine masculine. It's not exclusive to one or the other. And most of you are, are used to working solely with the divine masculine. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Action, action, action. And you're not stopping. So the next two years are going to be a challenge in that regard. I'd like to um, ask a question, I guess, more on a personal level in regards to the purpose of our films. Do you have any information as to you know, I guess the work that we are doing, what is the, the message or the bigger message that we're supposed to be getting out through our films, through this podcast, um, and how that might impact the world? It's helping people to see beyond themselves, the limitation of the 3D version of themselves, that there is more that is unseen. 
more that your science is starting to catch up to, that it doesn't mean that by this information being out there, that it threatens the totality of their being. So in other words, many will feel if their belief system is threatened in any way, shape or form, that they must attack or that others must share wholly their perspective of reality. And so part of what your work does is to help expand them without them feeling fully threatened. It helps to open them up to see beyond. And that's that's a really difficult thing to do and something that is much needed to see that there is another perspective of reality. So that's part of the work that you're doing. Your work is going to continue on. There may be... um, you might find that there will be two more films over the course of the next seven years. Right now, you might think, hmm, that's a lot of work, but it will actually unfold pretty easily and pretty effortlessly. Okay. I wanted to talk about the different vibrations within the universe. And when we were talking with Wendy before, she had brought up about the lower uh, channeling, lower vibrations. Would you say that there was, um, we've heard from other channelers that there is no evil in the universe, it's all a matter of perspective. I guess that's my interpretation of it. How do you, how would you feel about evil, and does it really exist the way we see it on TV or in the movies? Well, uh, again, you know, in order to play in this dimension, you don a, a role, you claim a polarity as a dominant expression of your being. You claim light, or you claim dark. Is it truly who you are? No, because who you truly are at the core of your being isn't light or dark. It's not good or evil. It's not one or the other, but it's the role that you've donned. So in some ways, when you ask about evil, does it really exist? We would say from your third level, your third dimensional level of perspective, yes, that there are those who are more interested in the benefit uh, in the use of of energy and power for the benefit of themselves as opposed to the collective. And that really is the only difference between light and dark. That the dark or evil is is only about the self and has no awareness of the ramifications of their actions, where the light is more oriented towards uh, the benefit for self and for others because the light perceives itself as being a part of the whole. So as you support and serve the whole, you are in essence serving yourself as well. That's the difference between light and dark. But in reality, is that dark being separate from you? No, that is an aspect of you. That is actually a part of you. And so from the higher perspective of reality, we would say there really is yes, no evil, but from where you're standing, there are some things that don't seem so great. But you are playing in a dimension of duality. And in order to play in that dimension, you have to have someone to play the dark role. If everybody was playing light, then you wouldn't really be playing in duality. So you will have those who will agree to play the darker roles, to have that vibrational experience. And we'll be honest, those are often some of the most interesting lifetimes that you've had because you all have had them. You all have chosen both light and dark lifetimes. It's not that you have sanctimoniously chosen one. One is not superior than the other. They're just different vibrational expressions. And that's part of what you're learning. This is what we talk about with the, with the release of judgment. It's, it is not right or wrong to have that experience. It's simply a vibrational experience. And you have a choice in every moment whether you want to continue having that vibrational experience or not. So somebody who may have donned an evil role may choose not to do it anymore. They may choose another pathway. They may choose in in a single moment to align with their divine self and leave that path behind. So there really isn't such a thing from the higher dimensional level as light, dark. That's just an aspect of the game that you all are playing. It, It would be like basketball players. They're on different teams. You need somebody to play against. If you're all on the same team, then there really isn't a game. And also, when we were uh, talking with Wendy before um, about channeling, I want to hear it from, I guess, your perspective. Are you, when she goes into the trance to, to pick up your frequency, are you 
waiting for her or are you already there? It's already happened and she's just tuning into that message? Well, from our perspective of reality, time doesn't exist. So every time that you all think of us, we're beside you. So for us, it doesn't seem like we've ever left you. It gets a little hard for you all to kind of wrap your brains around right now. But we are always with you in a sense. And then there is a part of our awareness and consciousness that's off doing other things because we can have multiple experiences at once. We're not limited to the constraints of linear time in the way that you are. So in essence, it's for us one long continuous conversation. For Wendy, from her perspective, it might be a day or two before we sit down and do a full verbal channel. It might be, uh, you know, a couple hours before she checks in with us. But for us, it's one long conversation. Uh, I guess the next question I had, it's kind of changing gears a little bit. I want to talk more about the things of Earth. <laughs> um, I want to talk about uh, animals. All right. Um, what, and this is kind of very changing topics very quickly. Um, what are the main purpose of animals? This is kind of like a childhood question that I've always thought about. And I, I, there's such a variety and there's some that appear like special, especially certain insects that seem to have no purpose. Like the mosquito, I'm sure is the purpose. And some scientists is screaming right now, um, listening to this. Uh, but is there, I guess my question is what, <laughs> brings about the variety of species to this planet and animals is just a, a, a trigger word for me so this is part of the grand experiment so earth is rather unique in its expression of life earth was seeded by thousands and thousands of worlds and all of the experiences of those worlds is encoded in the genetic material as it was given to all the creatures on the planet. So what happens holographically is that as all of those animals have an experience, there is not only the experience of that animal, but an energy that is representative of the collective experience of planet Earth, of the humans on it, and of Earth herself, that is also transmitted back to that genetic line. So... We're going to back up here just a bit to describe a bit more about the galactic experiment because there were other worlds and other star systems that was that were not able to go through this process of polarity integration. They failed and they played it out again and again and again with wars, uh, sometimes destroying uh, stars, blowing up stars and all the planets in that system. Um, and it's played out infinite ways, but it was too difficult for them to integrate from where they were. They couldn't let go of their beliefs. They couldn't let go of their patterning. And so Earth was created with all of this genetic material to allow for greater potential of variation so that it might be easier to find a solution to let go of the judgment. There are a number of star systems in particular that are playing out your programming uh, or, or that are being played out on this planet right now. So with the Pleiades, there's a lot of energy about teaching, about communication, about uh, your galactic history. A lot of that energy comes from the Pleiades. Then you've got the star system of Lyra. There's a lot of energy that, that happened there about hierarchy uh, there's also information about working with sacred geometry um, and uh, about healing that comes from the Lyran star system. Then you've got Sirius. There's a lot of competition with Sirius and Orion. Competition meaning either or. It's about I can hold this belief or you can hold that belief, but our beliefs can't coexist. So it's one or the other. There's a winner, there's a loser, and you're learning how to dissolve that energy to see it's not about either or choices, but about and choices. And then you've also got energy that comes from Cassiopeia, which is a much more loving energy, um, variations of love. 
so we've also got Arcturus, which is, is you're seeing a lot more Arcturus energy coming in right now, and that has to do with healing. That has to do with working on your light body to help restructure your energetic field so that you can carry greater levels of awareness and information in your body. So those are some of the main systems that are coming in. And within those systems and several other systems, um, well, a lot more than several, but there are thousands of worlds that donated the genetic material to the entire uh, species, um, to all of the species on the planet. So an animal itself can come for a variety of reasons and it depends on on the on the animal or the species um, a lot of the insectoids are holding the energy of hive mind for you all right uh, working as a group as a collective you see this very clearly illustrated with your bees all right that they work for the benefit of the whole uh, you have your whales and dolphins, which actually work with holding the planetary grid, working with tone and sound to hold the collective consciousness in balance. All right. So they're, they're present to be of service in that way. And, you know, you've got many, many different species that are, that are holding a particular pattern in place for you so that you can learn to integrate the, all of it. All right, the holding that in the in the collective consciousness of the planet. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, what would happen if, say, um, if we, you know, through the years we've we've made certain animals uh, endangered and we wipe out a whole species, uh, they become an instinct or extinct. Um, now, how? Is the, the the planet, does it do a self-balancing act or does it make it up some other way? Well, the the planet itself does, she's doing a bit of recalibrating as you're seeing in some regards to your weather. There's a lot of weather modification that's going on and she's not very happy about it. And so she uh, is is trying to counterbalance some of that. The same thing happens with species to some extent. Uh, animals are there also to be your reflection. So that when you have a species that goes extinct, it's really showing you in a very dramatic way that you are not living in balance with the earth and with the other species on it. You are actually right now learning how to be guardians for the planet. You're not doing a very good job at it uh, as you're not even really able to take care of yourselves. But the, the animals are there to be the reflection for you. Um, the earth does maintain in her records the vibrational experiences of those extinct beings. Uh, so in some ways, the balance isn't fully lost. It, nature will find a way of filling the void. So another species will expand or step forward to fill the void because nature creates balance. So if you've got, say, one species that was a predator uh, and that species becomes extinct, there will be another predatory species that will step forward so that there can be balance. Can you speak to the human's ability to be able to heal themselves and the power of the mind and how we're learning more and more that the mind is so powerful to be able to heal the body with some research even coming out uh, where our thoughts can actually begin to start to affect our DNA and how that can affect our own personal healing. Yes, so this is one of our favorite topics because your science is just now starting to catch up and this is, this is in part what Wendy was talking about before about creating your reality based off of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. It's not just your thoughts. Your emotions play a huge part in this. We would almost frame it as your belief system. Your beliefs are the culmination of your thoughts and your emotions. So it's, it's vital that it just doesn't become a mental process for you uh, because you're so focused on the masculine that you are over obsessed with your thoughts most most of you especially the masculine have been conditioned to suppress the emotional 
emotional state, which is actually the divine feminine component. If you want to label things on on sides, all right, because you're in duality, your emotions are the feminine and the, the mental is the masculine. But you've been taught to suppress the feminine. So the emotions really need to be addressed. Um, there are a couple things we want to say here that, that might sound a bit off topic, but we'll bring it back around. The emotions that you experience are usually coupled or linked with a thought. Emotions and thoughts are not always paired. So what, what do we mean by that? We mean that you can have a thought, but you don't automatically have to have the exact same emotional response that you habitually have. Because habitually, you have a particular emotional response to a particular situation, you couple them together. And what you're learning to do right now is to decouple those. So let's say uh, in the past, some, somebody's yelling at you. Your initial response, because you're, you may have a program that says, I'm not good enough, or you might think, I'm not good enough, what did I do wrong? You might go into a very dis defensive posture and emotional feel wounded and attack. As you start to process some of this, you can experience a different emotion. Somebody might be yelling at you, and you might all of a sudden have that emotion start to come up uh, of fear, but you might take a breath and say, hmm, I could react that way, but I'm choosing to express love instead because I see that they're, they're just expressing their own upset, and it doesn't have to be about me in this moment. So you are learning here to separate your thoughts and emotions. Now, as you create reality, the first thing that gets created for you is your body. Your body is created out of your energetic template. And this is why working with the mind is so important to heal the body. Because if you don't change the energetic template, you are not going to be able to permanently uh, change the physical body. You can do all kinds of things. You can have surgery. You can take pills. You can have a special diet. But unless you change the thoughts and emotions to create the frequency for the body, you aren't going to permanently change the body. And this is why so many people will have recurring health issues or say they'll go on diets, but they can't stick to it because you haven't changed the emotional or mental programming that created the vibrational alignment for that situation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. You understand? So um, we're very excited that your science is starting to recognize it so that you can start to work more with vibrational medicine because you are a vibrational being. And right now you're just working with the physical. For the most part, your allopathic medicine is just working with the physical and it's only a temporary solution. So when you deal with the issue at hand, and it, it may not be logical for you, uh, perhaps when you were three years old, you made the decision at three that it wasn't safe to trust anyone. You had to trust yourself only. You couldn't allow yourself to be supported. So as you went through your lifetime, you found that you couldn't allow yourself to be supported. You would always do things alone. You might find a sense of isolation or you might feel that um, all of your energy is for work and it's never for play for you. And that may show up in your thyroid. All right. That may show up as low thyroid. And you might take things for your thyroid, but that's only temporary. But if you deal with that issue that I allow myself to be supported, that thought program that's continually running habitually in the background that you set up at three years old, then once you change that programming, the body code can change. All right. You're not sending that frequency to the body. And so it doesn't show up in that same way and the body will automatically heal itself. The body has an amazing ability to regenerate itself. The body was actually designed to live for thousands of years. It wasn't meant to live for 80 years. But your negative thoughts have become so strong that the body is not able to repair itself and it goes through a death cycle. Can you see how, f how soon that science will catch up faster um, and there'll be that tipping point uh, well, we'll, well we'll be honest your science is is there in many regards uh, the problem is your monetary system uh it's the money that gets made off of allopathic medicine that is part of the problem 
we would say the other part of the problem is that people aren't willing to take responsibility for their health and well-being. They don't want to own their thoughts and emotions. So it's not so much that your science is necessarily going to catch up because your science is, the science is actually there. And there are those um, within world governments in, who have this full awareness and they are, the experiments are, are much, much farther. We will tell you that one of the most potent healing modalities you have on this planet at this time is working with tenant bands because you're working with pure frequency and you can work with the harmonic resonances. When you start to work with the harmonic resonances, you work up the dimensional scale and you can clear things out at a much faster pace. Um, your science, we would say, probably within the next three to four years is going to start talking more about sound healing, sound, sound medicine. Um, you are already, you are already having the modalities that are coming out on a weekly basis around the globe. globe. Modalities, modalities are given, given by, by angelic, angelic support or are or from the realm and the mental, the mental or, or other aspects, aspects of the world, 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 world that they're, they're working, working themselves. themselves. They're bringing the bring bring modality, modality, modality of healing, 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 healing a way of way the shift of programming, programming that work with work the energetic, energetic template as opposed to working just with the physical, physical body. 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 But, but part of that, part of that it, it has, has, has with your willingness to let go of your story, of story of who you think you are. You are. So even so even here in the face of science, many will not be willing to make that shift. They won't be, they won't be willing, willing to let go of the story of who they think they are they because, are because they're, afraid they're afraid of, of what will be left. Who will I be? Who will I be? Okay. Right. Right. Um, actually, we're running into some technical difficulties at the moment. The last 30 seconds or so, we got a lot of feedback um, or reverb. I'm going to have to disconnect Skype and call Wendy back. Hi. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> One second. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. probably, first, probably not uncommon, right? I mean, I remember when Mike and I, we did some filming and we were having some pretty, you know, in-depth discussion about all this medical, medical, metaphysical stuff that lights were being blown <laughs> um mm. for the lighting we would have like technical problems sometimes and <clears throat> i don't know do you find that <laughs> common it does happen occasionally yeah okay yeah I, I was thinking maybe i just bought cheap stuff but <laughs> 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 well, uh, well it seemed to work well for an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah well thanks for channeling for us is, is it does it become exhausting for you um, I'm usually good for up to three hours in a day. After that, it starts to wear me out. Okay. Because, um, yeah, because when I'm in that space, I actually feel more energized. And even when I'm ill, it's the best I ever feel because <laughs> I have to be in my heart and that allows more energy into my body. So it's usually very energizing. Well, I, I think we should probably have you back on at some point in the future. Um, I know you have a, a book uh, that's out. The Great Human Potential, yes. So that book is actually um, put together by, Mar by Martine Vallée, and it's excerpts from channelings that I have done and then also work that Tom Kenyon has done. And then from there, she asked some specific questions from the material that she had taken. So um, it has some uh, more galactic information, and then also with Tom, there's... Uh, practical information about um, working with energy and, and manifestation. So um, that book is available through Amazon.com, and it's available right now in English, French, German, Czech, I think, and possibly Turkish. I can't remember. So it's in a, in a number of languages. You do do a lot of uh, live workshops with l larger groups. You know, I haven't for a while. My my own work is, is going through a bit of a transition as far as that goes um, because I've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, the next one that I know I have coming up is in September on the 19th and 20th, and that's the channel panel in Los Angeles. And that's myself and seven other channels, including Lee Harris and Nora Harold and 
uh, Sean Randall and some, some other great people. And for me, the next other thing I have coming up is a channeling class, an online class. So that'll be coming out um, probably later in the summer or fall. Very good. I should probably look into taking that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, if you go to my website, I actually have 10 tips to help you create a deeper connection with your guides. So um, that's right there on the homepage if you want to know how to work a little more with your guides in the interim. Okay. And uh, how do you, uh, do you interact with your audience or your, your clients through Twitter or email? How, how do you want people to get a hold of you if they have a question? Um, so the easiest way is through my own website, um, or you can, t uh, you can email me at info at higherfrequencies.net on Facebook. I do have, um, I do have a site, higher frequencies, and there is some information on there as well about anything that's upcoming. Um, I do send out a newsletter once a month that keeps people informed of anything that's going on. And usually there's, um, some little channeling or new bit of information from the piece that I include with that. And then of course I do do private sessions and all of that is done online. So uh, people can find more information at my website, which is higherfrequencies.net. Okay. I, I do actually uh, have a couple more questions. I just thought sure. of um, about your work. Have you noticed that, and you've even said that your, your uh, career or your uh, practice is kind of transitioning. Do you see the information from the peas or uh, your maybe your guides to changing at all or maybe evolving since you started? You know, right now it's it's really on the subtleties of what we're creating and and getting really to the specifics because you know it's it's not about the things that are obvious anymore. I think by the time most people find me and find my information, they have a pretty good awareness of metaphysics. They understand at least the basics of the laws of attraction and reflection. And it's not so much that we have to work anymore with getting new theories, new information, new details. It's about actually putting into practice what we already know. So what I found over the last two years is really it's about helping people to put into practice those theories um, because we've we've been working for so long and amassing so much information that we, we haven't really stopped to implement it or okay. we forget that we have these tools. So a lot of my information lately is focused on that, working on the subtleties. And have you noticed, or maybe that you even heard through uh, the peas that do we, with each generation that comes in, are we, and I, I've noticed that just from my own visual research is that we are becoming um, more evolved quicker maybe in the last 50 to 100 years than the previous 6,000 years. Is that what they've confirmed or have they said anything different to that? Well, our growth is definitely exponential. Um, so the, the higher we go, the faster we go, the higher we go. Um, but yes, it's definitely exponential. And you know, for most of us within this lifetime, there is the potential and the ability to reach that higher level of awareness, to shift to a fifth dimensional perspective of reality. Um, and especially the children that are coming in, some of them are already coming in, plugged in with that perspective. And they're here to be our teachers. It's not so much us showing them, you know, how to to fit into our system, but they're showing us how to fit into the fifth dimensional system, how to work collectively, how to work um, with a greater sense of the whole. So a lot of these children are coming in that way. Okay. And they have very special gifts and abilities. Is this the uh, indigo children? That Well, there are a lot of labels. Yeah, they're indigos and crystals and rainbows and, you know, God, we love labels. Um, which is funny. That's the one thing that the peas are always like, no, we, we need to stop with the labels because that just puts us in a little box. And, you know, we want to label everything so we can feel comfortable. So we, we, we say we know what's going on, but it really doesn't serve us. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of new energy coming and um, beings from different systems actually coming into uh, incarnate into, into the earthly realm, which hasn't really happened uh, for a long time. They're trying to bring in new energy. And I think probably my last question, and it's 
you know, back, it's, I'm going back to the UFOs, my childhood uh, <laughs> uh, questions. Is uh, UFOs uh, disclosure? Is there anything to that, or, or, or do you hear anything different from the peas about that? Uh, well, there are a couple things. So, one, if you know, why do we? <laughs> This is, this is an hour conversation in and of itself. Um, <laughs> I figure it end know, on the big do, question. <laughs> why, why do we want disclosure? Um, there are lots of levels to that. At a personal level, uh, for many people, it's to be proven right. And so you have to really work with that issue in and of itself to know that it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. And if you're going to have that kind of interaction at a physical level, then you're going to have it. And whether disclosure happens or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, what the guides have said, in some ways, uh, it ser- it serves us for not having had it this thus far because it would generate too much fear for most people. And speaking from my own experience, it is one thing to know about it in theory. It's another to have a physical, visceral experience. Um, okay. And it, for most of us, at a primal level, there's still so much fear. And uh, they do say that disclosure is already happening. Um, We are looking for it to come in one big announcement, but it's happening a bit more subtly through documents that are slowly coming out. Um, I suspect, um, and from what the piece have told me, that within the next several years, there will be some sort of larger disclosure because it's time, it's time for us to become part of our galactic community. These beings are waiting, as I said, to waiting for us to reach a point uh, that we're not holding quite as much fear before they connect with us. That makes sense. But you're right about this could go on for hours because I just once you answer that, I have like ten more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. But you know, and there are a lot of beings that are interacting us with us now. Um, so it is coming out, and there are more and more people who are willing to talk about it. Uh, there's so much fear uh, about reprisal and judgment and being ostracized. And, you know, even to have that kind of physical experience with these beings, sometimes we don't fully understand what's happening, um, that we don't feel empowered in any way from some of these experiences. We label them as abduction, but there is a part of us that has actually agreed or contracted to participate, but all we take back is the trauma, and that's how we mentally interpret it. So we still have this trauma to process through our body in addition to the the trauma that we would experience by telling somebody else the story and then them calling us crazy. So there's still a lot to be integrated. There's still a lot of fear to release. It's a big, big topic. Yeah. There anything you want to add before we wrapped up? Because I know you probably got about f- less than five minutes before you have to go. I just really wanted to say thank you. You know, it was great to be able to join you today and and talk about this stuff. If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on Amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at Vimeo.com, GuyMTV.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at the past series. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs>